Eli, are you ready to start the lecture on food? fortuitously after the lecture on eating and hunger, uh, a lecture by Dr. Schiff from Seattle on shame uh, and guilt. Uh, and then we'll finish up on, uh, with, my, with my presentation, possibly another guest, I'm not sure yet, I'm working on it, for um, rational parenting, uh, self-regulation versus the failure of liberal, liberal parenting and education. Um, and uh, in, the, in the spring, I'm reorganizing, rethinking how the series is going to go on. We might, I'm trying to design some new venues and some new activities, so I'll keep everybody posted. Make sure if you're not, most of you are on the mailing list, uh, but if you're not, let me know. Okay. Um, that said, um, in, in, in a basic way, in terms of Reich's work, I started looking back through Reich's literature, all of the standard literature, and, and in fact, there's very, very little directly on the subject of food and eating. But if one reads through his comments and letters and things, the, uh, there emerges an understanding of the nature and function of food and eating from a biological perspective, and then from an energetic perspective, or in terms of uh, our work, organomic perspective. Okay? And some of this will run contrary to uh, standard views on eating and the function of eating. Some of it is consistent with what uh, I think most of us begin to learn. Uh, when, when we talk about food, it seems to me, uh, with, with the possible exception of sexuality is one of the most controversial and sensitive subjects, and, 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 and it possibly gets a little more uh, ease of, of, of discussion than sexuality because it's so unavoidable. The only other area, since we're talking about eating followed up by shame, is the other area which is directly at the other end of eating, which is waste removal. Uh, and in some ways, I don't think you can talk about hunger, eating, and food without talking about bodily functions. So in one sense, to start out with, when you, when you think about food from the kind of perspective that I'm interested in, uh, in terms of rights, understanding of biological function and the nature and function of energy, food has to be looked at in terms of its... Um, place and, and, and role biologically in the regulation of the organism. Now, in standard uh, nutritional sciences, food, of course, or in standard biology, you know, we're taught from the time we're in uh, elementary school, uh, today even in first, you know, kindergarten, first grade, that you eat for what reason? You eat to get the fuel that you need to fuel your system, to fuel the organism. Um, and obviously that there's truth to that. 
But one of the things that really emerges, and not just from Wright, but really emerges when one studies the biology of, uh, of, of uh, eating and uh, digestion and, and uh, pro food processing within the, the organism, is that food serves other functions that are not directly related to caloric uh, uh, intake, caloric count, and caloric um, uh, burning and immediate translation to specific uh, functions within the organism. Um, interesting, way back in the 1930s when Reich began to look at the sources for biological energy in the organism and when he and that's in, if you go and look at the bioelectric experiments, when they actually did caloric translation of adding up the calories that go into an organism, that, that food taken into an organism, including solid foods as well as liquid foods, what that would translate into in terms of caloric um, uh, you know, count, in terms of energy uh, creation in the organism, it, it, it comes shy significantly of what the organism needs to maintain itself energetically in terms of its operations. In other words, the two, you know, it doesn't add up what, it, as to how much your intake adds up to how much energy you actually use in, in, in daily function. And that was one of the first interesting clues for Wright to the fact that it wasn't simply food consumption that produced the, the biological energy in the organism necessary to maintain daily operation. It was one of the first clues that Reich and the people working in, in, in laboratories in, in, in um, Norway at that time, Denmark, began to suspect that there, there were other sources of energy or other energetic functions that were simply not about consumption of specific uh, solid foods or liquid foods into the organism. That said, once food is directly related to the creation of necessary elements and energy in the organism, you know, the question is, how do we respond to food? So the first issue is, certainly from an ergonomic perspective, the first issue is, where does food and what does eating have to do with, in Reich's terms, the orgasm form? One of the things that people often have difficulty with with Reich's work is that for Reich, all human function in some way relates back to the nature and function of uh, the orgasm formula. And, and finally, to the nature and function really of pulsation in living organism, in living matter. So I think the first thing that I would like to talk about is that that clearly eating in some way directly relates to the maintenance of pulsation in the organism. And that's not a very radical statement. Obviously anyone even in a mechanistic, very traditional view of eating understands that you eat, it maintains the ability of the organism to have motility, to have function. You don't eat enough, your, your, your systems begin to become depleted, your overall vitality becomes depleted. Um, probably live a lot longer, you know, all the new studies now show that, that if you reduce your caloric intake down to the point where you can hardly move uh, and do virtually nothing, uh, you can live to possibly 150, 200 years based on, on the new studies. The question is whether, it's the old story about whether life is worth, it's, it's, it's extra important and best, you know, uh, you know Methuselah lived 900 years, you know, but who calls that living? Right. Uh, but uh, uh, clearly, intake of food serves for vitality in the organism. And, but more specifically, when one looks at the nature of what we understand to be the orgasm formula or pulsation, and again, expansion and contraction being the fundamental you know, expression of all living matter, right? whether it's uh, an amoeba, or a complex multicellular organism like ourselves, if expansion and contraction is the center, then, we, then what role does food or eating more specifically play in that? Well, obviously, if one experiences, if you look at your own experiences with food, 
which are universal, that hunger can, is clearly an expression of some form of contraction within the organism, both on a cellular level as well as on a more complex um, uh, organic level throughout the organism. Okay? Uh, since there are some people here who are not necessarily conversant with the orgasm formula that, as Wright talks about, let me just give a quick um, overview of, of some of the issues. What Wright uh, articulated very, very specifically and, and uh, investigated and built a database for was a description of how organisms experience the processes of expansion and contraction. Uh, in, in their daily lives, okay, physically. So that organisms, and some of this was taken from things that were already beginning to be available in the 19th century, uh, from Burke, who was a physiologist of, of the physical organism, student of, uh, a, a teacher of Freud, and from Freud himself, the realization that organisms, living organisms, tend to go and, and to move towards or, 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 or or attempt to achieve a state of ease or rest, okay, relaxation. And that when that relaxation is uh, disturbed in some way, tension begins to express itself. And in that tension, uh, uh, there is the beginnings of restlessness, of what we call seeking behavior, or, or the technical term is appetitive behavior. Okay? Appetitive behavior. That's a good, uh, good crossword puzzle. Yeah. Appetitive behavior. Um, and what happens is, as the tension builds, as the charge, the restlessness builds, the, the way it becomes clearest is you see increased levels of seeking behavior, of appetitive behavior. In all animals, you see it in children too, any mother who's nursing or working with a child. In our... In our uh, Society, we talk, we, talk, we talk about it as the baby getting cranky. Yeah, it's like, mm -mm. Yeah, you offer it something. Mm -mm. But, they, but, but of course, as babies can't tell you what it is, they just, they, they, you start saying, I don't know what it wants. It just doesn't seem to want whatever. I want. It, but these are repetitive behaviors. They're seeking behaviors. Um, and when it reaches a, 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 a high level of charge, or what Reich would call the acne, the peak, it begins to become no longer simply appetitive, it begins to become focused behavior, and it begins to look for and focus on a specific resolution of the tension. So everything becomes focused on that. Now, we all know this in all of our bodily functions, okay? So, uh, actually, there have been very, very interesting studies uh, that, that support this outside of organic, one of the guys that I got interested in years ago when I was doing my, um, my, my doctorate was a, uh, a, um, a, a guy named Claude Pepper um, out in Berkeley, who remained this sort of obscure physical psychologist uh, who studied appetitive behaviors and, 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 and studied biological rhythms and organisms out in, at the University of Berkeley, nobody paid any Everybody left him alone, so he was able to do really interesting studies. Because you know. he was out in Berkeley in the in the 1940s and 50s, nobody thought you know anyone out in Berkeley could do anything mm -hmm. of any importance. So he did these in incredibly interesting studies of appetitive behavior. And what happens is, it, and, and they actually happen to absolutely, without knowing Reich's work at all, bear out Reich's ideas about orgasm for So what happens is the mice or rats who are studied get to the state of high charge. Mouse wakes up, they have two cages, right? One where the, all the food the mouse could, or rat could possibly want is over here, and this is where it lives, its nest. Mouse, rat wakes up, it, it moves around a little bit, it gets increasingly restless, right? It doesn't say I'm hungry, it just gets increasingly restless. But as the tension builds, to a, a crucial point, it suddenly stops pacing, it stops expressing restless behavior, and begins to move Im immediately to an entrance that leads to a series of mazes that it has to figure out how to work. And it works those mazes extremely efficiently, right? And it gets to a food supply 
and it does what is necessary to alleviate the tension, which is it eats. It doesn't eat because it needs food, it eats because it needs to relieve the tension. As soon as the tension is relieved, it relaxes. I missed something there. Yeah, okay. Okay, we got this, this rat. Right. Now what caused it to... I don't understand. What he wakes up, he doesn't know, I mean, we have no way of knowing. He doesn't necessarily wake up and say, oh, I'm hungry. He wakes up, but his behavior, with the behavior of the rats would indicate that they're not focused, they're not looking for food, but they're restless. They move around their nest, their, their, their cage, right? They could immediately go right for the food, but they don't. They begin to actually, in fact, when you really look, they walk in larger and larger, they pace and, and move restlessly, seekingly, in larger and larger circles. At some point, the behavior changes distinctly, right? It becomes less random, less erratic, more and more strictly focused, and at that point, at, at a key point, and it's always roughly about the same uh, time, and they move directly for this little end hole that leads to a series of mazes that they have to figure out. They figure out the mazes like that, right? And they do it even without smell, They can because they, they can close off the smell. It's just, they get to where they have to go, they get to the food they eat, and then the restlessness stops. Right. There's a call that you're making that I don't quite grasp. Mm -hmm. you're, you're equating um, um, hunger with a excess charge. It seems to me that hunger would represent a low charge, and you have to charge yourself out up, up again by by putting energy into your body in the way of food stuffs. Yeah. It's two different things. Hunger, and that's the case, hunger is more complex than the simple reality of feeling a, a, uh, a, a charge in the sense of being sexually excited. It, it, in, in fact, let's understand something, when you are sexually excited, for instance, right, is it an increased charge or, or, or a decreased charge? From what I remember of right, is because if your charge has reached right. the, the apex, right. and at that point, if you, 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 you want to release all of it. What we begin to understand, interestingly, in, in the biology of hunger, and this is, is, is crucial, is that the organ, the hunger generates increased energetic activity in the organism. So this is interesting. People, unless you begin to suffer from starvation, right. right? People who are hungry become much more alert, much more charged, much more restless. There's more energy. It tends to release not energy in the sense of the energy of food to burn. That's clearly depleted. That's what you need, right? But but what the organism is doing is energy is going towards and building towards, this is why I was introduced to the idea of repetitive behavior. What's happening in the rat, the rat isn't saying, I'm hungry, I need to get food. The rat is saying, I got this feeling, I mean the rat's organism is operating with, I have this feeling of, of, of tension, right? And, it, and what happens is increasing amounts of its overall psychobiological energy and behavioral energy goes towards that that tension and, and the impulse to alleviate that tension. Right? So in this case, the thing that it focuses on eventually and, and finds to relieve it is what food. As soon as that and it, as soon as the food is, as soon as the organism is satiated, what happens energetically, right? In terms of the the biological energy, right? is a discharge of that tension. But he could, okay. dis he could discharge that tension with a sexual... He might for a little while. <laughs> he might, might give him a false sense of, uh, 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 of relaxation. But finally, if, he's hung if we're talking about actual biological hunger, it won't work. People, we all know this. You can, you know, there are lots of ways you can substitute behaviors you know, for food when you're hungry that'll keep you going for a while. You know, without eating, but the final reality is when the biological tension builds and, 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 and the demand builds, then, then food becomes absolutely essential. When we begin to look at, a little bit later on, at, at pathologies in this process, 
that becomes more complex because people are able to do all sorts of strange distortions around these issues, right? Not dissimilar to the kinds of distortions they can do around any kind of um, uh, behavior that's essentially biological uh, in, in terms of, once you get into pathologies of these behaviors, you know, people are always like shocked at the kinds of things people will do around food or eating. It's not shocking when you realize all these behaviors are simply ways of attempting to avoid uh, complex, deep interper in in internal imbalances in the way the organism deals with tension and charge, with, you know, with, with its natural pulsation. It's always exciting to go sit down for a meal. Right. Okay, you're excited just about to either at home or a restaurant and right. you enjoy it, and then you relax. It's very simple. Yeah, no, it's very simple, and we all know, with, you know, it, we see it in movies and we laugh at it, we all know it, 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 it's almost a given, even if at times we get a little, you know, awkward about it, that food and sex are almost, you know, interchangeably related <laughs> on some level, right, for better or worse, and sometimes it can be problematic, but, but clearly there is some link there, and the result of that is... It, it leads to both humor, but also can lead to pathology and complex issues. The, the, the thread here is, and, and this is where I think, and from my perspective, organomy and Reich's work offers a great deal of insight into this, is that in traditional uh, medical and, and scientific or biological or physiological investigation of eating, of sexuality, of all these areas, they tend to be seen as separated. Sometimes people will talk about, you know, some, you know, interconnectedness, some relatedness. But what they all miss is that what all these behaviors are about are the regulation of natural pulsation in the organism. And they're just simply different expressions of charge and discharge around different activities, right? So that, in fact, for, for us, in this work, somebody feeling a high level of charge around eat hunger and, and having a good meal and enjoying the pleasure is, is, is simply fulfilling or, or playing out in, 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 in organomic terms an orgasm formula, except it's, it, it's around an oral and, and, and digestive uh, process as opposed to a genital process. But there are many ways that one can engage in charge and discharge processes, natural, you know, uh, pulsatory processes in life. It can be in play, it can be in, 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 in eating, it can, be, it can be in going to the bathroom, all of which are related. Everybody knows what kind of pleasure it is. I call it the ah principle, you know. What pleasure it is if your bladder is full, you know, and, and you're feeling an urgency, you know, to go to the bathroom, or if you're feeling a, a, a full bowel, to go and have a full evacuation is, you know, a, ah. A, 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 in a sense, all of these things are, are the same. Um, basically, what, what happens, too, is that food, because of its, of its nature and, and what it does, um, you know, um, once you understand th th this dynamic, uh, you have to then look at what the, what, the, the, what the digestive process does. So that when one brings food into your system, food, unlike sexuality, and there, the, the, here's a crucial difference, has a, ha has a mediate, mediative effect. So there's another step that goes on. It's not simply hunger, food, relaxation. There is a mediating step in terms of what happens to the food when it's in your system. For the time between hunger and satiation of hunger, you go into a relaxed state, but while you're in the relaxed state, something else is happening, which is digestion. And the function of digestion energetically is that it absorbs high levels of the system's energy, because the, the, the system has to slow down and uh, basically process, break down, and there's a lot of biological processing that goes on. In, se in straight sexual contact, what happens is, ideally, anyways, the system simply empties out and, and you know, uh, relaxes and replenishes uh, and, and begins to, you know, 
recuperate, okay? With eating, you have the additional uh, function of the fact that digestion requires a, a uh, pulling together of huge amounts of energy within the system to process uh, large bulk, break it down, uh, um, uh, translate into immediate uh, use within the organism, various uses within the organism, and removal of those um, uh, unused parts of, of the process. This requires a huge amount of, of uh, energy, not just energy from the food, but energy from the organism, you know, to organize this. The value of that is, is interesting because it also then becomes accessible to a unique feature of, um, of food and, and eating, which is that it can be used for sedation. It, it food becomes an extremely effective, probably one of the first available anti-anxiety uh, medications. Uh, that became that, that, that we became aware of in nature, and there are indications of that going back to uh, early uh, pre-historic, uh, uh, you know, very, very early simple societies, and even in, in, in uh, um, uh, the great apes, we see uh, during times of extreme tension in the group or, or, or fear. One of the things that uh, chimps will do, for instance, when they're highly Afraid, they do two things, right? Or they do three things, right? They run, they hide, they protect, right? They, they will sometimes urinate or defecate out of fear. But the other thing they do is they start eating excessively if they have food available. It's almost like a, a, a nervous kind of eating, you know, with a lot of very loud kind of protective shrieks, as Jamie Noll describes this when they're under stress, okay? So, so that there's a lot of good circumstantial evidence to see that food has a, a palliative and, uh, and sedative effect. It's interesting, and we all know this, and this raises profound questions about the way most of us eat and the way we live in this kind of society, right? Which is that the best way, that, that the best way to enjoy a meal is how? And not the French way. The French way is with a cigarette. <laughs> raises other questions. But, 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 but the best way to eat effectively is how? Some of you know. The best way to eat? Yeah. Well, first of all, when you're hungry, obviously. But, but, but the best way to eat is it, fairly traditionally. You, what you do is you eat slowly, right? Not fast. You eat small, you start with smaller portions, not large portions, right? You give yourself time to take the food in, right? Time for it to enter your system. And then when you're full, and I, we're assuming now ideal terms that you know when you're full as opposed to feeling that oh, I've got to have another piece of that, that's too good not to have another piece and, and stuff it in. But assume, we're assuming now ideal, you know, uh, natural function is then to rest. So the old story of, you know, people having a big meal and going out on the porch and rocking back and forth and watching the sunset while, while they digest, maybe taking a nap, turns out to be the appropriate pattern. Right? I still do that in a lot of right. and, and in fact, uh, primates, and this is not just human observation, primates, chimps, ape, the great apes, uh, uh, baboons, uh, orangutans, uh, and, and many of the, the smaller monkeys too. Smaller monkeys are, are more problematic because their metabolisms are so high that they tend to eat uh, almost uh, continuously to maintain and you know uh, uh, in, in intake. Uh, except when they're sleeping, they sleep in very fitful uh, patterns. But but in the great apes, right? The and, and, and in most mammals, most animals in general. Um, that don't need huge amounts of continuous intake of food to maintain themselves. The pattern is always eating to satiation and then sleeping, resting, uh, laying back. Uh, uh, and and uh, it is often uh, th that pattern repeats itself usually about two or three times um, uh, in, in any given 24 hour cycle. Okay? So, so we know that those patterns exist. So if that's true, 
left to its own accord, it becomes a very interesting process that, that, that functions quite well. However, if you then place that pattern in an extremely speeded up, rushed up life where you can't do that, where you don't do that, where, 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 and where on top of all that, without getting into issues about what's good nutrition, what's good to eat, what's bad to eat, which is part of the whole industry here, you know, it, it, you know of, of diet and stuff. But, but barring all these issues about what, how you should eat, what you should eat, we could address that. But, but the fact, the fact is that if it's all, if if this basic natural process is speeded up, and so that one eats quickly, eats fast, eats you know, large amounts, it has profound impact on the energetic regulation of the organism, the organism's ability to pulsate naturally over a daily function, over a daily routine. So ideally, obviously, hunger, or the first signs of hunger, aren't necessarily the first signs that the organism needs to eat, right? That, that, that there should be a point at which the organism, left to its own accord, should naturally zero in on the fact that what I need to do now is, say, you know, is satisfy or gratify this tension. And at that point, an appropriate amount of food consumed slowly enough for the organism to reach a point where it feels adequately engaged should be the pattern. In fact, in our world, in our life, it seldom operates that way unless we're either fanatical about it, as many people in the diet world become, or we are fortunate enough to be relaxed enough or retired or, or, or to give a huge amount of time and effort. Keep in mind also that this bears consistently with what's been going on in this society around food. That, that people the new, the new studies show that people spend increasingly less time, Frey and I, we were talking about, yeah, 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 at one point, people spend almost no time making food themselves anymore. Really cooking, you know, doing things from scratch, you know, uh, and, 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 and while we can be nostalgic about that, it's very, very possible that that process of doing things slowly, right, you know, doing things, the fact, the fact of cutting vegetables up, while you know, it might be fun too, also slows up the process by which you finally get to the act of eating, so that it tends, these kinds of things tend to produce rhythms that are more consistent with natural needs and behaviors. In nature, for instance, and this is a real problem, the people I work with, the anthropologists I work with, who down in Emory now, years ago brought out this cookbook. It was initially a joke, but it was actually based on fact. They, didn't, they, they had fantasies that it was going to become the cookbook, the, the diet book of, of, of the 80s, but it, it sort of faded as a joke. But it's an interesting book. It's called The Neolithic Diet, based on the fact that humans in nature were omnivorous. But the fact is that in nature, this is always a good trivia question, how much uh, meat do people ordinarily eat in nature? Normally. Meaning, right in nature. Meaning out in, you know, if you're a hunter or gatherer. Oh. Uh, like really depending on what you think. What? Not much. Not much. 20, the, the most efficient hunting societies right, can produce only 20% of their diet in the form of captured meat. That includes little boys and girls who go out and hunt around the, the, the camp for, for voles, little moles or little uh, mice or, or small animals, and, uh, and predominantly men who go out to bring down big animals. In fact, the hunting of big animals is an incredibly inefficient. Uh, they even get into um, uh, Arctic, you know, like uh, the Inuit Eskimos, they produce very, very little in terms of the hunting of large uh, uh, animals, bear or, or, or whale or, or uh, porpoise or any other kind of large, uh, you know, real predatory hunting. They mostly, instead of gathering fruits and berries, they gather fish, which is easily and plentiful. So, so, so that, uh, in, in fact, uh, hunting and meat is a very, very small part, naturally, of human diet. Right? 
So the result is you get into our century, right? You walk out the door here, before you get down the block, you're going to be hit with what? Like 20 opportunities to devour heavy duty beef or, or pork or chicken or some sort of meat. And that biologically, right, your, your, your meat lust right, is going to be triggered. Whether you like it or not, even if you consider it bad and you know from what you've studied that you shouldn't be eating that much meat, it's very, very hard. That's why, it's the fat also, kind of, that's why Mrs. Fields, all these bakeries and stuff, blow smells out onto the street. I mean, it's absolutely the same thing. You, know, you want people to buy popcorn, put out a lot of butter on it and blow it out into the movie theater, you'll increase your popcorn. So there have been studies done this that show that show it works, you know. Because there are these mechanisms that are, they're really not meat lust so much, it's fat, it's fat lust. It, it, it's it, it, it's an, you know, the appeal of the fat. We were just talking about Eli, or, or most kids, everyone knows this, is that, you know, you, you want a bagel, sure, you want butter, sure, but mainly they want the butter. So that, you know, you, you get, give the kid the bagel, they scoop out all the butter, more. You know, not more bagel, more butter, more cheese. But, but that is a literal biological mechanism. It works real good when you can only get 20% of that you know, uh, into your diet, and then, even then, maybe only on rare occasions. So that, and it's much more interesting, in, in, among the Kung Bush people, which I've done more, more studying of, it, when they bring down a large animal, no matter what anyone else is doing, they drop it, right? And they go wild. They have, you know, they, they, they have, I mean, we joke, they have barbecue parties. They, they just go and they eat as much meat as they can. First of all, they know that in a, in a few days, they're not going to be able to eat any of that meat because it's going to be spoiled. It's going to be, you know, you know. So you eat now while you have it and you gorge yourself on this rich, fat, and high, you know, density protein. And then you might go for another two to three weeks to months before you're going to get any more of that. Meanwhile, what you eat are uh, nuts and berries and, and small, you know, uh, uh, animals or, or, or insects. Okay, you eat primarily, as the, as the bush people say. Essentially, in almost every society, hunting and gathering society, there's usually one food that is plentiful, easily available, and very boring. And, and, and there are all these jokes within all these societies, if you read the ethnographic literature, they say, yeah, you know, we have to eat this food, but, you know, food can't stand it, but we eat it. And among the bush people, it's a thing called the mangango nut. Uh, the mangango trees produce this nut, which is really interesting. No one's been able to process it effectively except the bush people, because it's a nut that's the, 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 there's a nut that's about that big, right? but it's surrounded by a shell the size of, uh, of a coconut that's as thick as a rock. And you have to, if, if you smash it, right, you destroy the nut, the, the meat. So you have, there's a way to crack it that the bush people know. So the, we had these people who wrote this, this book about the Neolithic diet, also were trying to figure out some way to market. This, because the mangano <laughs> nut, interestingly, is the most perfectly balanced food known in nature. The actual analysis of the meat gives you all of your daily dietary requirements. It's an amazing product, right? But there's no way, and it only grows in the Kalahari Desert, does it? They try to grow it in other areas. It's, it's, it's fascinating thing. But the, but the bush people live on this. And they, 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 their humor is constantly about how boring it is, how boring it is to process, how boring it is to eat, but this keeps them going. So you get these patterns, right, of how and what food does. So, so that the issue is um, food in nature is balanced in terms of natural processes and rhythms, right? And, and we live in, in, in a world on many levels where these rhythms and patterns are completely violated. And, and when, what we all understand is when you throw things out of balance, you're going to produce abnormalities or anomalies in, in, in the organism. If an organism is designed to work one way, I mean, you know, to use a, me a mechanistic metaphor, if you have a car that's designed to run on, uh, on um, 
you know, ethyl alcohol and you keep pumping in heavy diesel fuel, you're going to, you know, you're going to destroy it and so it's not going it's not going to work. So obviously there's a consistent um, uh, uh, you know, uh, imbalance created by the very nature of the way uh, eating and, and food is, are dealt with in our society. Now, why that has come about, we can joke about in terms of the, you know, the way we were designed biologically to eat and to consume and what's happened historically. But I think also it comes down to looking at the issues of how societies then get organized and what societies have. So if we go to Reich's concepts of mass psychology, how do you influence people, how do you affect individuals in their daily life? Right? What are the things that you can play around with to, to, to create patterns and behaviors in mass society? One of the ways is through human sexual behaviors by, you know, disciplining, restricting, playing around. That, that certainly is one big area. Uh, and another area is equally and even more accessible is how you deal with food in society. And, food, and, and, and I don't think enough has been uh, uh, given either by Reich or by, or by almost anybody who writes on the subject that I know about is to look at how food has been used to control social behavior on a large scale, right? And then how food is used on a individual, it, within a family unit or within an individual's own life uh, to, to play out uh, in response to social demands, okay? So, certainly on a large scale, there were some individuals who were very sophisticated. Stalin, for instance, or earlier um, uh, leaders, even back into Rome, understood immediately. The, the Egyptians understood. The Mayans, almost all the major empires understood. You want to control people's lives? What do you do? You control their food, your ability. You, 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 want, you want to put, get people in shape? Create a famine or threaten them with horde. Pull back food, you'll get reactions. But you got to be careful. If you pull back too far, the reaction you could get is an explosion, a revolution, an uprising. But if you if you manipulate food resources, you get very very clear. You can have very very clear and easy control of, 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 of mass behavior. Food is an extremely powerful source on an individual level. Certainly in families, and that from a clinical point of view, we begin to understand that how people have been conditioned with, you know, in their families or how food is used in your own individual experience becomes extremely uh, intricate process of how individuals learn to use uh, eating or not eating or, or various ways of working around food to in some way control their experience in the world. On, on a daily or on, on a, a, a growth, you know, on, on an engaged basis socially, right? We know, you know, also just on the most simple levels uh, that you can create various moods based on the kinds of ways you use food or how and what you offer people when, when you have, I mean, look, uh, if, you have a, if you have a class or a lecture and you put out, you know, a cup of water for everybody, it, it creates one feeling. If you put out bagels and coffee or pastries or stuff, it creates another feeling. If you if, if you call if if you call it not a meeting but a banquet, in which there'll be a presentation, it changes the mood. These are all very obvious. Super, they appear superficial, but if you follow them, what they all indicate is that food is an incredibly potent uh, arbitrator and and and, and, and uh, operative in, in our lives. And, and not just because we need it to survive on a long-term biological basis, that it has additional operative uh, impact on, on, on the organism, okay? So with, with that as background, th then we can begin to ask the question, um, it seems to me, what hunger is? 
And that, that's a key question. Uh, we, we can maybe understand what eating is, what food is, in the sense of, you know, it's a source of sustenance, it's a source of necessary um, uh, operation. But hunger becomes a much, much more complex variable. Let me throw it out to you for change instead of just my, my book. What's hunger? Empty. Okay, empty. Right? empty. How do you determine what empty is? Feelings. Feelings. Originally, originally, the Asian feels hunger is pain. We don't, well, uh, we, we certainly, we, pain or some sort of, uh, what we would call, if we go back to the appetitive behavior, some sort of disequilibrium or discomfort, whether it's pain in the sense of being stuck with a, with a knife kind of pain, a sharp pain, or whether it's a dull pain. It's hard to determine exactly what kind of pain, but certainly some sort of discomfort. It could be reaction to some infants from right. scream. Right. When they're hungry, and right. that, that's got to be constant. Yeah, it's some, like, sort, it, it's, some, it's some sort of thing that we could feel comfortable calling pain. <laughs> Actually, Sorry. what about the word yeah. need? Need, Hunger okay. is need. Hunger is need. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I, I'll, it, it all, it all, uh, it all uh, registers. Go ahead, keep going. What else? Anything? The question is, how do you know that the hunger is a food, hunger, or a need of another sort? Now you're getting more, now it's getting there. Go ahead. That is the big question. Uh, go ahead, what else? What else when you, when you think of hunger? What else? Tension. Tension, okay. Thoughts yeah. about food. Thoughts about food. food. Okay. When I think of hunger, I think I'm rarely hungry. I'm rarely actually physically hungry or I need food. I, and it's a good feeling when you are and you eat. But so many times I just eat because I know I have to. Because if I don't now, I won't be up to later and then I'll be really yeah. hungry. Well, that gets into a whole other thing. Right. Okay. So, so the, the issue <laughs> is, is, is part of the problem is we can probably quite carefully register what a physiological hunger line is in terms of when the system, I mean, in other words, we could do physiological readings of when the system is depleted of certain essential, you know, uh, minerals, vitamins, uh, uh, um, uh, and particular uh, fluids to the point where Biologically, we can say, physiologically, we can say the organism is at risk. And, and, and if we uh, or depleted, we could probably get baseline readings of what would be, we would call a hunger line or a, or, or a line of physiological necessity for reintroduction of, of, of resources for the organism you know, to, to use. That kind, of, that kind of hunger we would call biological hunger. You know, by, and the problem is when studies are done to see how many individuals can register and, and locate and identify that point as their clear sense of when they are hungry, it's very few. Okay? Cats can do it, mostly. Dogs can do it. Almost all other animals appear to be able to. Humans tend to have, at least certainly, humans outside of hunters and gatherers, right, uh, tend to be uh, very, very poor judges of when they are biologically hungry, okay? Um, and given that, and he raises an interesting question as to why that's the case, why that would be the case, but certainly most of us go through life not really responding to biological hunger in the sense of, well, I shouldn't say biological hunger, uh, really more physiological hunger in the sense of literal levels dropping to, you know, your sodium levels dropping or your, 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 your uh, potassium levels dropping or your, or your you know, uh, need for particular fluids dropping, you know, uh, various kinds of uh, protein, you know, hunger, things of this sort. That kind of ability to read and respond appropriately when it reaches critical point or point of, of, of necessity, human, most human beings, certainly in, in, in complex societies, show very, very poor judgment or ability. So that when most of us talk about hunger, going back to Karen's initial remarks, is that what we experience is 
hunger as usually is emptiness or as a, a tension or as a uncomfortable feeling that that we somehow decide needs to be gratified. Problem with that is what produces that feeling? Is it purely a biological depletion that needs replenishing? Or what, once it's based on that kind of perception of one's sense of feeling empty, feeling inadequate, right? Feeling tense, right? Feeling attention. If that tension and inadequacy is coming from some other mechanism, some other problem, some other area, and is registered in the organism, we go to food or eating as one of the options for alleviating or, or, or sedating that discomfort, you're now eating to do what? Not to take care of hunger, but to take care of attention. If the tension is not specifically organic in nature, in terms of biological nature, the problem is you, in most cases, overeat it. Or, 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 like the chimps do it, right. and they're not even civilized. I mean, that's right. not, <coughs> not like a civilization kind of thing. Right. Like, when they're frightened, they're anxious, they eat. Right, but 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 in general, the, 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 the nature. When you do it in nature, what the advantage is? What nature controls. I don't understand. So there's usually not enough. Right. Oh, oh the, the supply is one. The supply. The supply is always it's very limited. very limited. So so that eat, so, so, so that for instance. Uh, um, bush, pe bush hunters, right, when they bring down a giraffe, which is the, the, the delicacy. First of all, and this is interesting, to bring down a giraffe, right, takes about three to four days, right? First you've got to hit it with a poison, a slow-acting nerve poison arrow. Then you've got to run it down so that the poison gets into the system enough so that when you eat it, it won't affect you. And, and, and you run, basically, bush people, and this is interesting, bush hunters run animals down, right, on average, across the desert, day and night, for three to four days, non-stop. This is why the incredible long distance run, okay? And, when, and, and get this, when you bring the animal down, the first meal is on site, right? And you have a nice hot meal, why? Oh, because all the meat is cooked. It's night. It's like opening up a steam tank. <laughs> I don't want to gross anybody out. When you, when you open up an animal that's been running across the Kalahari Desert, guess what you have? Steamed meat. That's right. It's not raw steamed meat. It's not raw. It's not raw? It's steamed. What do you think has been happening to the what, what do you think? What do you think is... No, they, they haven't died yet because it's not steamed enough. To, to, to overheat, but if you get overheated enough in the desert, you will die from, 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 from being cooked. When you die from overheating, what are you dying from? You're being cooked. That's what's happening. What happens is as the muscle, as you run in heat, your muscles generate heat. Your meat, the meat in your body is becoming steamed. It's a great idea. Hunters don't cook. What? Like when the hunters don't cook. They do, but nobody's opening them up to eat them. I mean, if they get caught by cannibals, then the cannibals have a nice steep meal also. But the fact is, when you open up an animal but that's been run, right, the meat is tender, juicy, and steamed. And that's, and, and that's considered one of the best feasts, you know. Then what they do is they bring in, you know, they, they butcher, and then they bring back. But most of the meat that they bring back by that time, it has to be cooked on fires, and it's, it's, it's not tasty, it's not, it's, it gets, you know, you know gamier, it's, it's not, you know, it, it's, just, it's just not as... It's Great idea for a Yes. <laughs> run, run down your own animal, <laughs> you know, slaughter it, butcher it, and, and, uh, and eat it. But the fact is, um, uh, this, this in itself also depletes the hunters so that what they're eating also, so that nature itself creates this kind of inevitable balance, right? We're, as Reich always said, we are out of touch with our nature. And it's not just because we're at fault, society has produced kinds of circumstances where it's almost impossible unless you get into some fad group or some new kind of activity. Maybe we should go out and all, you know, organize a giraffe hunting 
you know, uh, you know, cult or whatever. But the fact is, because of the mass psychology, the mass organization of society, we are cut off from these natural processes which allow us to balance, in, you know, our processes of using feet, food or experiencing hunger in nature. Okay. So, so the point is, is if you're eating that way, your access to to these kinds of processes of checks and balances, right, become relatively stable, right? This has profound impact. This new study just came out, fascinating study. I, I think I've mentioned in here before that that one of the great mysteries is that in young in, in, in the West, okay, um, the uh, uh, men's the, the menstrual cycle, the onset of, of menses in, in, in young girls has been moving back almost a year now. And, and girls by 11, uh, 10 even, you know, but, but definitely by 11 are beginning to experience onset of puberty. And there's been no adequate explanation for exactly why. There's been some discussion about diet and this and that. But a new study has just come out, a cross-cultural anthropological study, which is, it, which is strongly supporting the fact that it's directly related to amount of body fat on, in, in, in young girls uh, or in, in women. Uh, and, and what's interesting is in nature, it takes so much to get to a point where a young girl has enough body fat to adequately sustain a pregnancy that contrary to what everyone thinks, even though girls in nature at 15, you know, 13, 14, have onset of menses and then, and then have sex, they don't have babies. Girls in nature tend to have their first active, effective pregnancies at what age? Does anyone know? 15, 16. Keep going. 25. That's right. Oh, much, wow. closer to, much closer to the, to the low oh, to wow. mid-20s, yeah. right? The reason is, if you have to work your behind off, literally, right, to get the food you need, you don't build up enough body fat uh, to sustain hormonally the triggers that would indicate that, that uh, and sustain uh, effective uh, implantation and effective maintenance of, of a fetus. So it's not that they don't get pregnant before that, but most of those pregnancies don't succeed for various reasons. And, and, and the result is, in our society, what is getting interesting is that even poorly fed populations of girls, girls from poor nutritional environments are getting more body fat uh, at an earlier age, which encourages readiness in terms of the biological signals for, for early you know, maintenance of, of pregnancy beyond what, what the organism is necessary, what the society is necessarily well, ready to do. Hmm? You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Back in the days when I would send my summers in a tent, camp at night, I can remember my the feeling that I had of really a feeling of well-being. Because everything that you do when you camp requires an enormous amount of effort. You want to do right. something, you got to go get the water. Right. And it could be like a quarter of a mile walk right. Right here, and build the fire, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that when you eat, so, and that brings up the other thing, is that there is this pattern of the way energy gets regulated in nature is different than the way we sit down to a meal. It's not that we don't have the pleasure of sitting down to a good meal and enjoying it, but if you can sit down to a good meal three, day, three, three, three times a day, right, and in between those three times a day, you're mostly sitting on your behind or, <laughs> or running around doing stuff and nibbling because you're anxious and, and it helps keep you, you know, a little bit sedated. The problem is you're doing nothing in between to regulate the normal biological rhythms and patterns. So, so that what it tends to produce are complex uh, issues around food, body weight, and, and uh, the way we use food, okay, that, 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 then becomes, that then just becomes available for other kinds of functions that are not about simple biological rhythms, biological necessities. It's, it's just similar to what Norman was saying. In the summer when I'm off, right. I don't have to go to work, right. I notice, like, I always lose weight because I eat very slowly, I eat very little, I just relax. 
And as soon as work starts and everyone's like rushing around, you're rushing around, you're eating, you're picking up a danish, you're picking up something. And mm -hmm. it's just like what you're saying, I, I really see the difference. Even without going and hunting for it. It's right. like even, even it's different. differently. It's a whole different yeah. rhythm. Right. So, so, you know, and we can't, and if you look at most of the diet crazes or exercise crazes, what they're predicated on are trying to find ways, mechanically, of inserting back into your life ways of distracting, taking away from the issue of what goes on between, you know, impulses to eat. And, and also, most of the, the diet crazes are trying to teach you all, not only ways of controlling calorie intake, but of controlling ways of thinking about food, or or not, to, or ways to distract you from, from thinking about food. So if you don't think about food, you won't. You, 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 but, but all of it is a response to the fact that something is out of touch with natural patterns. Now, now obviously, the answer is not to go back as these as these anthropologist friends of mine and start eating as Neolithic, you know, uh, hunters and gatherers, but the point, I think, is well taken in terms of something is out of whack. Now, the other, then the question then becomes, if that's the case, how and what does hunger become? How do we use hunger? So in this, in this regard, it moves us towards, or at least moves me in my thinking, towards questions of uh, what happens if the natural processes are disturbed? Okay. If these natural processes that we've been discussing are disturbed, uh, you're going to get some sort of malfunction or, or pathology or, or dis-ease. Okay. So that, I mean, one of the classic stories is I, I was treating a, a woman who was obese and clinically obese. And you know, at one point, you know, she was making some progress, but not, not, not the progress that she hoped to make. Uh, I had all the things I, I, I had given her Reich's response, you know, via Dr. Sobe about how to lose weight. Stop eating. Stop eating. Yeah. Shut your mouth. Don't eat. You know, uh, which is you know, which, which has a certain basic truth. The issue is, you know, and, and, and I think Reich understood was you know, there was more to it than simply that. But at some level, it is just that. Okay. So this woman, in, in out of frustration, understandably, went to a eating a diet guru to a group, and she sat in this group, and the basic advice that this woman was giving for $400 a meeting was, only eat when you feel genuinely hungry. <laughs> and if you only eat when you feel genuinely hungry, you will lose weight, right? you'll be healthy. So I looked at it and said, right, I, I would have told you that for $250, <laughs> you have, you know, or even less. You know. I, the point is what? Recognizing the right. If we were, obviously, if we were in a state where we could understand when we were genuinely <laughs> biologically hungry, the world and everything else would probably be an infinitely smaller and better place. I was reading this book of how to lose weight by, um, is it Deep, Deep Pop? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. right? And he had this great way to find out, figure out if you were hungry, you just put your hand on your stomach and feel if you were full. And I was like, I was starting to do that, and it was amazing because. If you've eaten, mm -hmm. you feel like there's food in there, and when you haven't eaten, I mean, it's a little like trick of getting trying to get in touch. But first of all, you have to empty out completely to get that, because because the average person in this society is almost never empty. Right. The fact is, is that most of us have one of the reasons. You know, if you go to your doctor, a regular doctor, and you tell them that you have a bowel movement two or three times a day. They'll say, well, that's within normal range. The reason being that most people have so much food in their systems, right, that you're always able to have a bowel movement because there's always waste being removed, right? That doesn't mean everybody ha goes two or three times a day, but it's not abnormal in this society. In nature, people have much fewer bowel movements, which also has, interestingly, a great advantage. In nature, you don't want to have too many bowel movements. Right. Because you're, you're vulnerable. very vulnerable. Yeah. Other animal, that, that's one of the times you're most vulnerable. So the point is, eating is a very, very complex process, and and, and, and there are all these you know legend laws, you know, you know advice about how to find out your hunger. But the fact is that most of us, as armored organisms, 
as organisms who have tried to figure out how to do it as we've, as, as we've gone along, are not likely with great ease to know when we're hungry. If we are, as some occasion you run into it, to your great horror, individuals who can eat as much as they want and have a metabolism that burns it off before it even hits the stomach, then of course it doesn't matter. But few of us live or have that kind of metabolism, right? And even some of those people get shocked when they hit around 40 and the metabolism changes and it doesn't work that way anymore. You know, and they're getting heavy. But, but in fact, it is probably an indication of uh, not a problem that, that, in one sense, eating disorders are a misnomer. It, it, it is really, in my experience, and I think from my, my work for economic, but in general, that eating disorders are symptoms of other, much more profound emotional, <laughs> psychological, behavioral disorders. <laughs> The result of which is that eating is a very, just as with sexuality, sexual disorders are also areas because of their profoundly human characteristic. In a sense, to be human is to be an organism that eats, you know, you know, you know, ha has sexual behavior and defecates. These, these are areas of, you know, absolutely essential biological reality, physiological reality of being human. So those are the areas that are most actively vulnerable to disturbances if there is a disturbance not in eating, it's not an eating disturbance, it's a organism disturbance. It's a disturbance of the organism that in any given individual can express itself in many ways. And in some individuals, it's a, it, it, what, what the avenue of most, of least resistance for expression is eating. And so if you look at and what the origin of eating disorders are, of all, of, of all variety and all intensities, are almost always the result of individuals who in one way or another are experiencing some imbalance in their natural regulatory energetic processes. So um, the, uh, the answer depends on the armoring of the individual. Some individuals um, and their particular structure and the strategies that they've chosen in their lives to deal with, uh, you know, uh, the pressures and stresses that we all will be subject to living in the kind of world that we live in. So if an individual needs instant gratification of tension at all times, cannot tolerate, you know, emptiness, cannot tolerate, you know, this feeling of hollowness or, 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 or uh, uh, the beginnings of hunger or pain, you know, but, but often begins to feel anxious, um, and this can lead to a variety of overeating problems. Right? Why? Is it constant? Yeah, because it's sedation. It's a, you know, the child learns very early on, like, oh, if I feel that way and I have a Snickers bar, you know, it feels good. I mean, it, it's, it's and, and, and it gets more complicated. Studies, interuterine studies, show that the, that, 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 that the um, uh, um, presence of even a small amount of sugar solution right, in amniotic fluid uh, uh, produces a very, very extreme reaction on the part of the fetus. So in other words, we're able to look at this now. Uh, we've discovered, for instance, that there's a phenomenon called amniotic respiration, which is actually a misnomer. It's not respiration since there are no lungs. It turns out that uh, fetuses ingest about 20% of their uh, nutritional needs through the, by swallowing the amniotic fluid and regurgitating it, spitting it out. Okay? Uh, it looks like breathing. When you see it on film, through fiber optic film now, they go, then they push it out. And, and it's turning out that they're literally uh, absorbing a certain amount of protein and other uh, salts and, and nutrition in, in, and, and uh, uh, chemicals from the amniotic fluid. Uh, it turns out if you introduce a small amount, you know, Nestle's would love to get a hold of this, right? The smallest amount of sugar solution into the amniotic fluid, right? The, the fetus goes 
bananas. The, the, the amniotic respiration, the amniotic consumption, just increases the baby don't stop going. <laughs> so, it's, so, so, so that this, tech, the, 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 this mechanism biologically is there. So when the organism, as, as it gets older, learns that, oh, when I feel restless or uncomfortable, eating this or eating or doing this physically, whether it, it can be other physical solutions, but eating is, what, it, it, the, the thing about food and eating is that it's easy. It's quickly available. Other children will masturbate. They'll sit there and, 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 and soothe themselves masturbatorily, but what's the problem with that? It's, it's less, it's less, well, it might be convenient initially, but socially it's not approved. It's not easily maintained on an active social level. Whereas grabbing a Snickers bar, eating here, doing this, doing that around food is not only approved, it's not even strong until it becomes it's excessive. It's encouraged. Uh, and, and as Reich would say, is that when a behavior exists as a prevalent behavior, the question you have to ask is what does it serve? There's got to be a reason why masturbation or, or, or genital soothing is discouraged in our society, but eating excessively for any kind of tension, you know, uh, organization or drinking, right, uh, is encouraged. Yeah. I have a question there now, when you were describing the fetus, the sugar caused it obviously not to be sedated, but to be more excited. Oh, I should, I, I, no, I should, I, I, it should, I didn't go through the end phase, after it gets enough of it. It, it becomes quiescent. Sugar what? Becomes what yeah, I mean, eventually it gets sated, it, it gets sated with, but the initial response is, give me more of that, give me okay, more of that. Eventually it gets to a point where it, you know. Business, it, business, business, business. Business. Yeah, and I, 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 it was just, I just didn't continue it to its natural. All these things lead to, as with eating, you know, even, even if you have an eating problem, you know, where you eat obsessively, uh, in our society, you go through phases where you feel satiated for a moment or for a short period of time before you feel the need to go again. You know, uh, but, but but the issue is what the long term impact is. In the in the place where I work, there's constant talking in the when we eat about how they have to constantly have this like, have a sugar fix, uh, and I'm trying to equate that to sedate. Are they trying to sedate? Absolutely. When the kids come back, I'm a teacher. When the kids come into the classroom, they, if I, when they're very hyper, I think, what did they have for lunch that has made them so... So is the sugar exciting them, or is it sedating No, what happens is sugar initially sedates, gives them a nice energy rush, right? But then what happens is it's very, very short term. The problem with sugar is, if you look at graphs, it's fast, so but if you look at graphs physiologically on sugar consumption and the impact physiologically, it's always like this. So it's, a, it's an ideal addictive substance because in order to maintain yourself up here, right, you got to constantly have more of it. You know, you know, um, the thing that I don't understand is that there seems to be a disconnect in, our, in the evolutionary cycle. The fact that sugar is attractive to the fetus mm -hmm. means that this is not a uh, societal thing at all. It's, no, it's uh, biological. But almost most nutritionists, and some nutritionists I know, say that sugar is the absolute worst thing for you to They're eat. They're wrong. They're, They're wrong? wrong. They're, sim They're simply wrong. They're talking about raw sugar. Right? Yeah, raw, talking about raw just straight sugar. sugar. Straight sugar. But in nature, one doesn't, one doesn't, never eats, uh, you know, you know, processed, refined, raw sugar. You get, yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, the the quick cycle you're talking about is even faster for processed sugars as opposed right. to like uh, fruit sugars. Right. Fruit in nature. In nature, you eat your fruit in terms of what's available in the natural sugars in in, in the food you're you're eating. It's not it's not about it's not about you know the kinds of sugars that we're dealing with, which are, are both sugars. Well, they're right about he's talking about he's talking about the correct. It's not sugar per se. It's processed sugar. It, and, and it's also bulk of sugar, and it's how sugar is delivered. 
A nutritionist diagnosed claims that the body does not distinguish between sugars. And that That's sugar right. is sugar and is extremely no. but he's wrong. bad he's wrong. for the organism. He's, he's simply he's wrong. Tell him, mm -hmm. him, ask him, ask him to show you any study that shows. It's absolutely wrong. Sugar is an absolutely natural sugars delivered appropriately are absolutely necessary as our salts for the maintenance of body of physiological body function. It's simply any any nutritionist who will tell you otherwise is 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 just basically off in Yennevel with some some theory. You know, wait a minute. There are everything that you eat, complex carbohydrates, break right down into sugars in your body. It, that, that's right. That's so so but, that's what we're saying. But the, the but fructose, mm -hmm. which is the sugar from fruit, mm -hmm. is a not a complex carbohydrate. It doesn't matter. In nature, you get the, you, first of all, animals, right? Do not eat pure fruits only. They eat fruits in combination with other grains, berries, plants, right? Some proteins. The whole combination and the amount of food you get in your diet basically allows it to process on a natural basis. Basically, most contemporary nutritionists, to the extent that they know much, and, and people who call themselves nutritionists today, in this society, you know, you, all you need to do is, I could go out and call myself a nutritionist, you know, it, 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 it doesn't that matter. Be nice. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't matter, but the point is, the point is I could, and offer a theory about how to eat. The fact remains, right, that, that it, in fact, most nutritionists that I've read or, or have very, very little understanding of natural, biological, physiological functioning. Uh, uh, and, and the result is, is that it's patently absurd. Sugars are a natural, necessary, physiological part of what the organism processes. Doing what a lot of kids will do, I mean, I mean, I, I've sat, you know, watching my daughter and her friend take a, a pack of sugar and dump it into their mouth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, it's pretty horrifying, but, you know, I mean, you know. Uh, but that, that's obviously not the way one is intended to consume sugar. Otherwise, I always joke, otherwise, you know, in nature there would be these little packs of sugar <laughs> you know, all, all, all under every rock, you know. But obviously, that's not what we're talking about. But balanced sugars, delivered in balance, in, 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 in context with diets that are operative in nature, produce, you know, what the system needs. And the system needs particular salts, particular sugars, particular minerals. But... Um, you know, it has to be delivered in a normal process. So certainly it's appropriate in this society to discourage people from consuming large amounts of sugars and, and processed sugars or even fructose uh, if, if, that's the, if it's being done in excess and if it's not being done in a balanced, in, in a balanced way. But the issue is, again, that based on how the individual operates, right, the way the individual will come to food and use food becomes interesting from a clinical point of view. So that the, the error often made in the study of this, you know, eating, so-called eating disorders, is that they miss the, the linkage. All eating disorders have a common thread. And the common thread is that individuals use food as a way of attempting to self-medicate or to self uh, to, to adjust their system against those feelings of discomfort. Food has a unique quality in that it is one of those things that can be, that can, uh, as we all know, offer you instant gratification. Much easier, at least in our society, than sex. Right? Because you don't have to wait, you don't have to find, you don't have to figure out, you don't have to get there. <laughs> no you know, it, it, It's nothing. It's just, you, know, you just go down and you get what you need you and, and, and it's there. You, know, you, don't even have to, you don't even have to look for someone who's going to be your supplier, there's adequate supply available. Okay? Uh, so it's even better than drugs, you know, in the sense that it, it's constant. So that kind of instant gratification for most of us, provided we're active, provided we can operate with, within some degree of reason, usually does not produce a disorder. It might produce occasional times when we've eaten too much, or times when we're, we put on a little extra weight, and we have to watch ourselves. It usually remains within relatively normal 
uh, parameters. But for someone who begins to use it as a constant uh, way of regulating their mood, right, and if their metabolism cannot adequately process um, the, 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 the level of consumption needed to maintain sedation or, or, or a state of relative ease, you're, be, you're going to begin to see obesity or overweight or kinds of uh, you know, physical related problems from, from, from food consumption that, that would classically come under the area of overeating of anywhere in range from just moderate overeating to production of physiological obesity. Clearly with obesity, you're usually dealing with uh, metabolism and physiological uh, you know, aspects of the organism that, that are overwhelmed by the level of food consumption uh, in terms of this mechanism. You know, moderate overweight are obviously organisms in one way or another that can, re that can moderate the impact of continual use of food or types of food. Many people develop strategies, right? So they'll eat perfectly well or very little, but they'll eat only one kind of food excessively, right? And, and, and that always gives them a kind of sedative effect. So as long as they keep everything else relatively low balanced, right, their weight problem doesn't necessarily uh, become, become an issue. Uh, yet when you begin to investigate it or work clinically with it, it's the use of the one area where they operate excessively that becomes a, 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 a uh, clinical uh, issue. Alcoholism is a perfect example. Many alcoholics moderate their weight. Now, some alcoholics become obese, you know, because they use food and alcohol continuously as alternate ways of, 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 of sedating themselves. But many alcoholics work out a system by which they drink excessively, right, which tends to build up calories, but they eat almost nothing, right, as a way of compensating for how much caloric intake they get from alcohol. So their weight can remain relatively uh, you know, not a marker of, of, of the problem. In some cases, they can even remain thin because they're really not getting much. Uh, yeah. And then you begin to see later on a lot of, you know, organ problems, not just from the alcohol, but as a matter of fact, very good indications are is that people who are alcoholics who also eat well, right, in addition to drink well, usually do better. They might not be thinner but they do better in the impact long term of alcohol on their system, right? Uh, as opposed to um, individuals who deplete themselves on all levels in order to compensate for, you know, the ability to drink larger, high caloric uh, liquors. So, so there, are, there are enormous range of strategies. On the other hand, if the individual um, uh, can't tolerate sensations of relaxation. If they get anxious when they experience ease and pleasure of gratification, right, from eating, right? Anorexia. Yeah, you're going to begin to see attempts at regulating against that by various strategies of how you eat or don't eat. So one strategy can, can be anorexic, which is the depletion of, of caloric intake, right? Uh, or, and, and the problem there is it can often look like what the individual is really focusing on is that they want to look thin. That's one of the misleading aspects of, of anorexics is that, oh, I'm, I don't want to look fat, right? But what's really underneath it is an inability of the organism to tolerate the pulsation that comes about as a result of eating. It's too much, it's too much physical, it, it sets into motion too much physical sensation. So what the what anorexic, is doing, anorex, anorexic is doing as a strategy is attempting to diminish, right, physical pulsatory sensation in the organism, right? But sometimes um, when you don't eat for a long period of time or a little tiny bit starving yourself, you actually have more, you're more hypersensitive and have a little more energy. Yes, and sometimes. But, 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 right. But it also, one, depends on your structure, and also, it does, we're not talking now about occasional variations within a normal 
process. You're talking about someone developing a consistent and yeah. persistent strategy, which is different than feeling occasionally, you know, heightened by the fact that you're, you're not eating. First of all, to start out with, none of us are usually capable of, 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 of being accurate about that because the average person, you know, certainly probably in this room, and in general, who suddenly decides to go a day or two without eating, has so much, you know, food resource, fat resource, <coughs> that that all it will do is really basically, uh, you know, allow the system to begin to really regulate itself and, and process excess <coughs> body weight. So, so that's not necessarily what we're talking about, that you can feel heightened when, when, when sometimes you're a little hungrier or when you, when you go without or you de deplete. All of these systems, by the way, whichever, whatever happens, what all of this does always, eating, not eating, all these things affect energy flow, just as with any medication. Energy flow always basically increases or you feel energized initially. It's what you, you have to look at over a 24 hour or sometimes 72 hour period in terms of what the normal pattern is. You can take, uh, I mean, for instance, alcohol is a perfect example. The usual immediate reaction to, to, to drinking alcohol is what? Relaxation. Relaxation and elation and a feeling of expansiveness, right? But alcohol is actually what? Depressing. It's a depressant. So, so, so that, what, how does that happen? Initially, it relaxes you, you feel energetically a release, right? But if you look at it over an extended period of time, the organism then pulls back, shuts down. So you have to look at it, you have to find the, the, the actual cycle, not what the initial reaction. There are many poisons right, in nature that initially give you a big rush in which you feel you know, uh, wonderful until the full, you know, the, the full effect of the poison works through your system and then it's, you know, it's shutdown time, you know, so, 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 so these are complex patterns. Um, there, there are numerous, I mean, there are others, you know, um, uh, you, know who, you know, you have anorexia, you have bulimia, you have a wide range of eating disorders. What all of these disorders share in common are attempts at controlling discomfort with normal processes of expansion and contraction in the system. And, and, and to talk about one or another becomes difficult because you get lost in all the specifics of, you know, so, so that one can look at anorexia and, and read you know, tons and tons of descriptive literature of how anorexics do this or how anorexics do that, and what, and the same with bulimics, uh, and the same with obese, you know, compulsive eaters. What they all miss is that they all share one thing in common. That they are all individuals whose systems cannot tolerate normal patterns of expansion, contraction, tension, charge, discharge, and have developed in one way or another a common set of strategies on a broad base level, meaning that all of these disorders really are not specific different disorders, they all are essentially compulsive, obsessive compulsive disorders. They are patterns by which individuals develop, you know, repetitive ways of regulating and, and modulating or leveling these uncomfortable ups and downs within, within, within the system. So, so, so that uh, uh, the clinician can often be misled into trying to figure out a solution to a specific individual's presentation while missing the fact that underneath it is the deeper complex issues about how that individual deals with stress and deals with uh, feelings of physical, sexual energy or biological energy moving uh, in, in the system and uh, uh, what strategies they develop to avoid those uncomfortable, empty, tight, tense, irritable, unhappy uh, feelings. Um, you know. Well, I, I think you were saying that the, 
I recently uh, came in the, the opinion that someone should annotate the complete writing of Reich. Because uh, as you read Reich, I mean, yeah. even yeah. someone who is totally in his corner, yeah. I thought to them, all he talks about is sex. Sexual depression. Well, he does. But, but once you understand that what he's really talking about is the basic life function, right. not only intercourse, but the basic life function. When he talks about sexual repression, he's talking about a repression of the life function, basically. Right. Then, really, he's correct in what right. he's saying, but it, it doesn't come off that I way. Understand. I understand. What, what understand. must be understood, even for a group relatively like this, who have, most of you have been involved with or interested in this work in, in some way for a long time, understand, when Reich, Reich himself said that his biggest mistake was using the word sex and sexuality, <laughs> because in our society, you know, it, it, it's too charged with meanings that had nothing to do what he was with what he said. What, and that's why you'll notice, as much as I can, I try to not avoid the issue of the sexual act or sexual function, but, but bring it back to the deeper issue, which is the nature and function of pulsation, expansion and contraction of the biological organism, which is really what, for Reich, what Reich is really talking about, and he says this himself, when he talks about sexual function or orgasm, he is talking about a process of how expansion and contraction in the biological organism is regulated. Right? It is not about, and I, I emphasize this over and over again, it is not about the specifics of the sex act. That's why in this lecture tonight, in, in this presentation today, I'm talking about the fact that the same issues of expansion and contraction operate when you look at something as basically biologically uh, central as eating. That's why we, you get more interesting stuff is looking at someone like Freud and, and psychoanalysis where everyone talks about eating and sex. Woody Allen would do a lot of that, eating and sex and all this kind of stuff, right? Because Freud understood that, that they shared very similar connections, but he assumed that they were substitutes for each other. In, in, in organomic terms, in right terms, they're not substitutes for each other. They are sim simply functionally identical. They are simply different expressions of the central thing that they share, which is the normal pulsatory functions of expansion and contraction in the organism. So it's not that, you know, it's not that eating a good meal is a substitute for sex, it's that eating a good meal, right, in, in many ways, you know, regulates or responds to processes of tension and discharge and, and biological expansion and contraction in the organism in the same way as a healthy, good sexual contact does, or going to the bathroom does. Or almost any activity that we All oh, right, or playing, or, or, or engaging so, in a good social contact, in a good uh, gregarious social interaction, dancing, numerous things. Some do better than others. Obviously, what Wright was very clear about, and, and we shouldn't miss this, is that a good, healthy sexual contact between two individuals at any age in, in a full, you know, surrendering context is one of the best ways. Because, and not because of any personal reason, only because it, 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 it discharges more and it gives a fuller reaction. And, and, so, and so that's just, just as it is. It's not about one versus the other. It's about the common functioning principle of pulsation in life. I think it also needs to be mentioned that part of why so much of the material is weighted more heavily in terms of sexual function as, as, as opposed to the other ones you mentioned is that because out of all of these sort of life functions that represent pulsation, sexuality is the one that has been overwhelmingly the most repressed and, and inhibited, right. and, and that and, and right. forth leads to the right. most problems. Right. Just let, let me quick, just let me quickly, following in on that, in nature, you know, among Bush people, the last thing in the world, is, I mean, they, they would find it absolutely hilarious that anyone concerned themselves with either having a good time sexually and eating. You eat when you can, and actually, for them, eating is much more charged because it's 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 more precarious at times. You know, plus 
you know, it's harder to get a really good meal, you know, in terms of a giraffe, as opposed to the mangongo nuts, you know. So, 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 you know, I mean, that has a lot more significance than that. Sexual function is, what's the big deal? You know, you feel, you feel sexual, you, you know, you, you, you roll around, have a good time, you know, and, and, and that takes care of itself. So, so, again, a lot of it has to do with what's, I mean, it's interesting. So we suddenly live in a society where sexuality is much, much more charged, much, much more controlled, much, much more, less, even in a society that's as liberal and as, as open as ours is today in, in the sense of accessibility to sexual act or sexual acting, there's much, much less accessibility to sexuality as just a casual you know, response as, as um, Reich used to say, you know, it should get to a point where when you're thirsty, you pick up a glass of water and you drink it and you feel, you don't I feel thirsty put, anymore. I thought he put that whole thing down. That was a Russian thing. No, it was a Russian yeah. thing and he said, no, he did not put it down. Really he said it's absolutely correct. It was Vera Schmidt who said that in, in, in the Soviet Union, that sex should yeah, become yeah. as natural as drinking a glass of water. And then everybody attacked Reich and everyone said, look at this, this is what they think. And Reich said, she's absolutely right. Because what she meant is, when you're really thirsty, right, you pick up a glass of water and drink it, and what do you feel? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Right? So he was saying, that's right, sex should become such a thing that when you're really in need, you do it naturally, and what you feel is great, but you don't spend the rest of your day thinking, <laughs> was this good? Was it bad? You know, it, it's just becomes as ne that, you know, and that in fact it is our society that is obsessed with quality, kind, nature, meaning of sex. In in in, in simple hunting and gathering societies, I mean, my favorite anecdote was the same anthropologist I work with. It was in the Bushman studies. Brought a copy of one of the last trips they made back in the seventies of Playboy. A copy of Playboy to, to show to these Bush people who thought this was the greatest thing they'd ever seen. Not for any of the reasons we did. They just thought it was hilarious. They just thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. That anybody would, first of all, first of all, they couldn't believe that anyone had breasts like that. I mean, you know, I mean, they had never conceived of, you know, what, what, what you know, that, that, that these were female breasts. The next thing was that anybody would make pictures to look at naked pictures just didn't make any sense to them. You know, it just, I mean, so what they were laughing at is how crazy, uh, in their terms, the, uh, the, the, these outsiders were, because they, 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 you know, and their response is, yeah, you want, you want, you, you want to, you know, have some contact sexually, you have contact sexually, I mean, who the hell cares, who the hell thinks about it, it's no different than going to the bathroom or drinking a glass of water when, you, when you're hungry, it, it's, it's different only to the extent that it's more fun, you know, it, it, you know it, it's so, so that, which is not to say that we can somehow become those people, I mean, that's, that, that's a thing, what I'm saying is, is that it, it, it's charged in our society in a way and, 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 but that the message is food is more permissible for it. Well, 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 there could be more money in sex too. I'm not, I'm not going to get into, <laughs> yeah. into, into, into the question of, 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 of marketing and stuff. But certainly, you know, there is, what you have to ask is what does the society gain by making food a highly organized, highly controlled and highly um, uh, both functional and dysfunctional aspect of living and, and, and at the same time separating sexuality or putting sexuality in it. That, 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 that there are things structurally that this produces in the society that allows for certain kinds of controls or certain kinds of issues. Money might play out, obviously, but, but money plays out on, on all of these things. I keep thinking about that in terms of what society gets out of it. And there are two models about eating that you've talked about and that I've read about. Mm -hmm. One in terms of the three meals a day that we were talking mm -hmm. about, when you're hungry, you really... Right. I think that, I mean, if you look at it in terms of what society gets out of it, if you, most people when they eat that way, eat too much, right. and then they're tired, right. they sleep, and therefore are submissive, they don't act right. out, they don't, right. you know... Right. But, uh, right. you think a lot of, I think a lot about the right. self, Southwest, and a lot of those states. Right. Moving into New York, and some of the more um, 
the articles you read about eating five or six small meals. Right. You're never that sedated. You're never right. that That's right. down. You're, quote, productive in the sense of fast mm -hmm. paced moving around and producing a society that way. Well. Isn't it also it's a weird. result, though, of the kind of society that we have that with the whole industrial revolution mm -hmm. and people having these, these work hours and then they have the lunch mm -hmm. hour? Right. And no, I think, well, right, I think all of these things, you know, play in, and, and I think what happens is society immediately picks up on those things that are most easily available for, for regulating people's lives. And if you had to choose the two areas, the, uh, the two or three areas that are most central and, and the most basic way of regulating people's lives, it would be through control of natural biological functions like eating, which is the most immediately central and available, sexuality, which is a little bit more you know, problematic in terms of because it doesn't play out in quite the way eating does on, on, on an absolutely public daily routine, although it does in nature, but certainly that's another big one. Uh, waste removal, defecation, rest, sleeping, all these areas are very interesting. For instance, new surveys show that virtually nobody, right, in, in anyone who wants the article, I'll give it a very interesting article about sleep, nobody in nature and historically has ever, it's not until recently, that anybody ever slept alone. And most people in this world do not sleep alone. Most men and women sleep separately in, in, around the world, right? And they sleep in groups. And they sleep, get this, on average, much longer than we sleep. In nature. In, in, in nature and, and actually in, almost in all societies. Most people outside of, uh, 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 of industrial society sleep on average 10 hours a, a, a day. Really? And complain about it. Right? They don't like it. They don't like sleeping. They don't like sleeping. It's too much sleep. But the reason is, it's very clear, is that if you live in a, in a community where nothing is happening between, between 8 o'clock at night and, and, and 8 o'clock, uh, 7 o'clock the next morning, 5 o'clock the next morning, what can you do? You basically sleep, you stay in, you sleep. And they sleep usually in groups, you know, uh, separate rooms, sleeping in separate beds, you know, isolated sleeping is a very, very new phenomenon and very, very limited worldwide population size. And what's, what, what are you deriving the point of that? Of that, of that are, I mean, it just describes it because, because, interestingly, when people sleep together, guess what? They have sex. They socialize more and there's more social intercourse, both sexually and personally. They know each other better. There's far less levels of anxiety. And, 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 and eating becomes far less a, an individualized, you know, separate, isolated, you know, uh, secretive kind of indulgence. So I mean, this is an improvement in our culture. Uh, not, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm just reporting the facts. I'm just saying that these things, yeah. If you, uh, I, I, maybe you should continue first because no, I'm no. going over to a larger question. Well, if the discomfort with the natural expansion and contraction of the organism is constantly being uh, upset by eating incorrectly or eating, you know, as you've been describing it, and the same thing with sex, I'm sure there are many areas. Is it the individual who is uncomfortable themselves, or is it the society that is uncomfortable with the natural rhythm? All the above. <laughs> All right. The individual is ultimately, from your point of view, from my point of view, it's how I experience it personally that, that motivates me, that affects my, my behavior. But we are products of the social system so that so that our imbalances, our discomforts are reflections of what we are responding to uh, associated. Uh, stress, for instance, would be a perfect example. If it, it, we will all have characteristic ways of responding to stress in our life. And that's where a lot of this stuff plays out. So, uh, so the result of that is, uh, even with alcoholics, right, uh, many alcoholics, unless they're in the most extreme grip of their, of their uh, addiction, 
will go through periods where if they're fairly relaxed and fairly comfortable or in a relationship that, that, that is fulfilling or relatively uh, productive, will often moderate their drinking, even though they still use it. But under some cases, they'll even stop drinking. Right? But as soon as stress becomes, uh, reaches a certain critical point, the behavior comes, comes about again, sometimes very aggressively. The obvious answer is because the individual then goes back to what it, he or she knows to, to, to deal with. So on an individual level, there are many strategies, many ways we do it. But clearly these things play out socially. These things, and society, the question one must always ask, it seems to me, and that comes from with the prime, you know, questions that Reich always said, is if it exists in society, if it operates, you got to ask, what does it serve? It, there has to be some functional reason that, that, that it operates there. Society gets a certain kind of compliancy, uh, a certain kind of ability of individuals to tolerate a great deal of distress, a great deal of, 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 of limitation in their overall uh, biological functioning. And, and, and just to finish up you know, in, you know, on this, in terms of doing treatment, one of the problems in doing this treatment, but doing any kind of treatment, is to the degree that we bring individuals, myself, you, anyone who's been in treatment, to the degree that you get hopefully healthier, or healthier in the sense of not superior, but healthier in terms of functioning better, right? Uh, often that means that you're going out into a world where the stresses are felt more intensely and the problems are more, at times, uh, stress producing and, and the struggle is more. And so if, if all of a sudden you've been someone who's always been able to deal with stress, you know, moderately affected by, by drinking a little bit, right, or eating a little bit more, and you suddenly don't have that, now you have to begin to deal with stress you know, in a different way, because the reality is the fact that you can get healthier, it is presumptuous on, on the part of any practitioner of any sort to assume that because you get healthier, life is going to get necessarily easier or better. It just simply means you're potentially and hopefully in a better condition to struggle with the things that come at you, you know, in, in terms of your organism and do things that are far less. What happens is most of the, there's nothing wrong with using eating to have pleasure. Right? The problem is, is that when that becomes a compulsive activity that, pre that, that prevents you from being engaged in the world, then it's a problem. There's nothing wrong with, with masturbating for pleasure. But if, but if you're masturbating five, six, seven, eight times a day because you can't stand the tension, then there's a problem. There's nothing wrong in having a, you know, an active sex life, but if every time you, you know, you, you, you're feeling the least bit of tension, you feel you have to have a sexual you know, uh, th then you're talking about a different kind of, uh, there's nothing wrong in drinking. And all these, uh, uh, Dr. Sobey, we worked with uh, for many years, would say, no, no behavior that anybody presents as a problem is a bad behavior per se. So the alcoholic is not doing anything wrong by having a drink. It's, it's what's happened with the process of drinking. It's what the drinking has become. I, I've known, I've had a patient once who became profoundly sick by drinking water. She compulsively drank water. You know, I mean, obviously, you tell somebody, you know, it's good to drink eight glasses of water you know, a day. She was drinking 25, 35, you know, 50 glasses of water a day. Every time she began to feel tense, she drank a glass of water. Did it work? For a while until she became overhydrated and began to have, yeah, she had problems. I mean, there's a lot of problems. Yeah, I mean, the salts, I mean, there's a huge range of problems. You, you, I mean, the problem is, you name it, there's a behavior, you know, and it also depends on a lot of things, and it also depends what kind of permission we get. We know, I know of a, a guy, it wasn't a patient of mine, it was a patient actually of Dr. Sobey's, who in doc, found in a book where Dr. Reich said it's okay to have a drink. You know, to drink, you know, to drink a little bit. This guy took it as permission to go out and become an active alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Mike says it's okay to drink. You know, you got to watch what I'm saying. So, so, so you know, it, it's again we can give permission, but it's a question really. We're all trying to get through as best we. I mean, I mean, and I'll finish that. We all try to get through as best we can. There's a huge array array of behaviors that are useful and productive. 
right? Mm-hmm. Some, but 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 in if they become obsessive, if they become compulsive, if they become you know uh, so uh, uh, controlling in our in our overall operations of our lives, they can begin to have profound impact uh, on, on our functioning. Then you're talking about limitation of function, and, and that's where then clinical intervention can, in many cases, and sometimes help. Um, so that's about what I, you know, that's the right. thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I just want to now you go ahead. You go ahead. Right. Because he talks all the time. Just a quick one. You know, yes, when no, we no, were no. talking about, the, I mean, eating has been given the stamp of morality among the other possibilities. Do you think there's been a trend toward making it immoral now because so many diets are out and so bad no. to be? No. 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 Moral to be bad. More so. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it's body bad. image. But, but, but the final reality is, what does everybody want? Listen, I'm, I'm on a, I've been on a diet now, and it's been working really great. And to me, the ideal diet is, you know, is, is because this diet allows me to eat things that look like candy, taste like candy, and, and I feel I'm getting all the stuff I get by eating candy and, and drinking malt as I'm doing slim fast, you know, and it works. And interestingly, by the way, just for those of you who know, that the, the data, on, the, the long-term uh, studies of, slim, of diets show that slim fast is one of the healthiest and the most sustainable diets, and that people who do slim fast tend to lose weight and keep it off for the longest period of time. But forget all that, because that could change. <laughs> that, could change next, that could change next. That, that could change next week. Okay, they could turn out it's up, turn out. The point is, what does it do for me? It gives me the illusion that I'm doing everything that I that I'm not supposed to do. You know, but I'm losing weight. So obviously, there are all sorts of diet. Everybody will find the, the issue is clearly people want to reduce body weight, want to you know do this. I mean, I also exercise five, six days a week. You know, I always have done that. But the point is, these are all just ways of how you maintain yourself and things. The, it, that's really not about you know turning against food. Clearly, the message in the society is eat. Food, 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 is, food is the right thing, and drink, and be merry. You know, for tomorrow you will, uh, whatever. Uh, we'll, uh, yeah. As a, as a food professional. We have a food professional here. I was wondering why her, where she was going to I think the trend, and, and I, I don't cook in a restaurant anymore, but I do uh, work with magazines. And I think that the trend is that people want to be healthy, and they want to Because the fact is, fat is absolutely essential, natural part, and we're designed to consume fat. You're not designed to consume, you know, you know, a a Burger King rib, you know, based fat dish that's fried. You know, you're designed to eat foods that have natural, you know, fat content that you consume and process. And that's it. It's, it's what your organism is designed to do. And so, if you don't get enough, your right, right, your skin, right. Your absolutely, skin, right. it's, it's crazy. In fact, becomes a taboo. Right. It te- it's turned a, into. But all this stuff tells you, by the way, what all these diets and these fads, what all these fat, what all these diets and fads really tell you. Is that there is th- that there is a profound problem around the issue of eating and of na- the natural dietary processes and the natural rhythms within the organism? So obviously, if anybody really had the definitive answer to get everybody to eat the right way, then it would also have to address getting everybody to operate rationally. And the only person who could do that would be me. <laughs> that's what that's what gurus often do. I have all the answers. You follow me, and, and you will eat normally, and everything will be right. And and, and that's the single worst. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. The, the single worst. The single worst process is doing that. The issue is to get yourself to a point where you can operate to some degree rationally, so you can make rational decisions about how to try to balance your life in it in terms of a whole range of behaviors. 
So okay. next time, on the 20th, it's you can come and find out about all the shame that you experience around. Okay. 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 Okay.